We're live. Good catch. Hello, everyone. We see people coming in. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're so excited to have you. We have Arma Garcia here, who's going to introduce this beautiful topic we have here today. Thank you. I'm excited to see all your athletes on the call, Irma. Hey, welcome, everyone. And um, again, welcome to Damani. It's a great opportunity to have you here speak to many of our students. I know this is going to be incredible, incredible session. Um, but before that, I, I'd like to introduce to you our incredible and vibrant president. Um, it, let me explain a little bit about uh, President Miguel. It, he's, he's similar to what salsa music is. When you speak to him, it's constant music. Um, so we're really fortunate to have him as our leader, Damani. Um, you'll find that um, this is a person who really instills education and learning um, and really through athletics as well. So we're really fortunate to have him um, as uh, lead St. Francis College. So please let me introduce to you our fearless leader, um, President Miguel. <laughs> Thanks, Irma. That was better. Monique introduced me today. She just said, here's the president. I mean, so I appreciate at least you saying something about me. Uh, I know I'm not the main event. Damani, want us to be very clear. Thank you very much for being with us. This is, uh, this is critically important for us, as you know, to get young people to understand what the options are. So I appreciate you sharing um, your journey with us. Dave Cummings, uh, I appreciate the work you're doing with the college, brother. Really, uh, really critically important to have partners like you. Uh, on this mission to try to get young people to uh, aspire, right? I think that's one of the biggest things is how do we create aspirational attitudes? And, and I'm gonna give a shout out to a couple of people real quick, Moni more prior chief of staff who continues to drive this agenda in some very important ways. Uh, Dale Favors, who's a, who, who remains a partner. And then uh, Maggie Martini, who's also on the call and Irma Garcia, just Irma Garcia, hey athletes, you, I, I don't think, I want you to, I wanna emphasize Irma Garcia is a legend in her own right and she downplays it. But I think that I want you to understand that you have a woman who is a trailblazer in your midst and you've got to take an opportunity to engage her when you can. Not every student athlete has an opportunity to have an AD like her. And so I urge you, and I know her door is open, I urge you to engage her because you're going to learn a whole lot. So I thank folks for being here. I just want to drop one little nugget. And I tell this sometimes to athletes when I talk to athletes. You learn things on the playing field that sometimes you don't transfer to the life field. You've got to really work to make connections. You are learning all the time. You're developing habits that are gonna serve you in life. There's, there are things that you can bring to the table that other people don't bring to the table. I will say this, and this isn't a knock on people that aren't athletes, but if you perform well in the classroom, well on the field, and well in community, you got a leg up on folks that didn't have that trifecta but you've got to take advantage of it. And you can't make excuses for underperformance in the classroom because you're an athlete, because nobody wants to hear excuses. People want to understand that you were able to achieve in the circumstances that you were in. So I hope that you take a lot out. I know I had an opportunity to talk to Damani, so I look forward to the conversation. Once again, I appreciate your presence, brother, and I look forward to a relationship. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you, President Miguel. I guess I don't need an introduction, so I will introduce myself. No, he said it. <laughs> Hi, I'm Monique Moore Pryor. Thank you all for being with here with us today. I first want to say thank you for the co-partnership uh, with Athletics and uh, SFC International, Vice President Reza Fakari and uh, Irma Garcia. You are a, a true, true support in this arena um, with our students. I'm so happy that international, um, SFC International is here. Um, the work they do is just uh, amazing and Damani will definitely be able to um, enlighten them some more about what's possible out there and all of our students who are on today for Zoom. So usually I um, decrease people's bios, but um, between our interviewer, uh, Dave Cummings and Damani, it's, uh, it's a lot that I don't wanna leave out. I mean, I mean they're both our, our married fathers. And, um, and so that's, a, that's the first thing. Um, but if I can just start with Dave, who is newly uh, a new partner with the college, he is helping bring 
to um, our, our students at St. Francis College in the communication space, athletic space, on, you know, different um, jobs um, that you may not have known or, or knew existed. So just spreading awareness of what the possibilities are out there. So Dave uh, Cummings is the president of DEK Strategies. It's a boutique consulting agency uh, that specializes in communications and content media strategy. And before Dave opened uh, this firm, he was a sports writer for the New York Daily News and Miami Herald. Um, he covered college and professional sports, and he covered major, um, major events, the Super Bowl, NBA All-Star Game, to name a few. Um, in 2000, he joined uh, ESPN, uh, the magazine, as general editor for the NFL coverage. Um, he was also on the editorial team of the NFL, NBA, college basketball, um, just to name a few there. Um, but he struck out on his own with DA. DEK strategies and his current clients include the NFL, Montclair Neighborhood Development Corporation, and a host of other multimedia um, industries that he pours into. Um, and he is a public official and he's also a graduate of Morehouse College. Uh, Damani Leach, who, um, who I'm just now meeting and it's a pleasure. Well, I've met him a couple of weeks ago, but we thank you for being here. We know your, your schedule is very busy. Um, so Damani was named to the NFL's chief as chief operating officer of international in April 2019, overseeing all NFL internationals operations globally outside of the UK and Europe, including key priority markets of Canada, China and Mexico. He is responsible for driving international fan development, player development, sponsorship and consumer products just to, he has a whole list of things he has to do. So his job is pretty big, <laughs> but he joined the NFL in 2015, uh, serving as vice president of football strategy and business development. But prior to that, he worked for the NCAA's uh, national office for more than 17 years. Um, he's a graduate of Princeton where he was a football student athlete. So athletes on the call, you can learn a lot from them from him. Um, he knows how to manage his time. That's one thing I've learned about athletes. They do know how to get it done in a short amount of time. So thank you uh, for joining us, Damani. Um, Dave, thank you for bringing Damani to us and I will pass it over to you. And I hope everyone can hear me. I, and um, Damani, thank you very much for participating in today's program. For sure. As Monique said, we know you're busy, so I want to give the audience you know, a really good chance to hear from you. And I'll start off with the first time I met Damani, he was coming back from Australia. So he had been there for a while. So understand when he says he's busy, his passport will really show you that, um, at least his recent passport. And so what I'm gonna do, Damani, I wanna start off, you know, with the obvious question. And that's what advice would you give today's college student? And in this case, student athletes, as they get to where you are or how they can get to where you are? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think there's a few things. And in, in for me, I, I think about just sort of my life and journey and, you know, early on uh, growing up in Tacoma, Washington, um, you know, not from what you would consider to be an Ivy League family. I think anybody would consider to be an Ivy League family. Uh, didn't have Ivy aspirations. And, and so one of the things that <clears throat> I've noticed over time is really just sort of, you know, opening my eyes up to what is possible, what is out there in the world, how big the world is. Um, I know a lot of the, a lot of it is, you know, if, if you see it, you can be it. Um, so part of that means opening your eyes though, to what is out there and the possibilities. I didn't think this is where I would be. Um, certainly when I was growing up, not even when I was in college, um, but, you know, just understanding how big the world is and how many opportunities there are um, to find success, to find your passion. Uh, be open to it and be flexible. So when you when you look back on your career and you, you made a couple of things there, give me two key decisions you made that you believe really led to where you are today. <clears throat> I know there were many, but just two, because I want to give the audience a chance to really think about that. Yeah, I mean, I think I think one was talking about opening sort of your eyes up was was just going to college and where I went to college and and for me, the things that I learned there were, um, you know, it's, it's 
the phrase of, you know, it was I being a small fish in a big pond and, and seeing, you know, as you go to college, you realize, right, there's a lot of talented people in the world. So you get you get a sense of just, you know, how big the fish are in the pond and then also how big the pond is. Um, and so um, that was pivotal for me. And just, you know, a lot of people don't. You guys are all in college. A lot of people don't go to college. Um, and, and certainly there are things that you learn, but then just experiences in your perspective about the world you pick up. Um, so that was a key one. And then, and then I would say, you know, as I transitioned out of college, it was, um, you know, making a decision to pursue my passion of sports and working in the sports world and just understanding that that was possible and what it was to work in sports if you weren't a, a coach or a player um, and, and heading down that path. Um, was another really pivotal one for me because um, prior to that I was you know thinking about doing other things whether it was in finance or law or something else primarily just because that was what everybody else was doing and I thought that that's what you were supposed to do and I didn't know um, until I, I did a few summer internships and realized what I don't like um, I didn't like staring at spreadsheets all day in the finance world so um, that was the wake-up call for me to pursue what you're passionate about yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting you say that I started out as an accounting major. And then after a couple of classes, I was like, this isn't me. Um, and I loved writing. I love sports. And I was able to put the two together. And so, as I was saying earlier, so we met NFL offices. You at the time, I think, were SVP of the football operations, which basically mean you ran everything on the field except for the players. And so through that, when, when I think about how the, the multitude of skills it takes, you know, as a former college athlete, you know, you're, you're, how did you, what skills, main skills do you think transferred mm -hmm. to your professional career? Yeah, um, and, and I'm someone, you know, as a former, definitely former um, student athlete, I value hiring former college athletes. I put a significant weight on it. Um, and the things that I think about are um, certainly time management, I think Monique mentioned is, is a key. Um, and that just sort of gets drilled into you um, as part of just trying to survive in college. You have to learn that skill. Uh, teamwork is another important one that um, a lot of people don't have in the workplace. And those, those that can't work as part of a team, it's hard for them to thrive really and be successful. Um, and, and I think also just taking criticism and building on that and not letting it break you down um, is another key. When you see people who weren't athletes and aren't used to having a coach yell at them or not even yell at them, just, just having a coach tell them that they didn't perform well and, and then taking that information in and then turning it into something positive to improve on the next time um, all of those things that you do throughout your entire life, and particularly in college, um, all transfer over really, really well to the workplace. And that kind of goes to, you know, you sent those key learnings. And I don't know if Dave can put them up, um, because I'd love for you to be able to expand on those topics, because I think what you said, I know one of them was discipline and sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And you already mentioned the size. Here we go. You already mentioned size of the fish, size of the pond. Yep. Um, and so as you as you look at this, these these you know items there, break them down for us a little bit closer. So you know, discipline, sacrifice, money management. Yeah, I mean those were those were things. It's hard to tell from the logo. That is a uh, that's a picture of the Tacoma News Tribune. That was my first job um, when I was in middle school and high school. I delivered newspapers back before there was an internet. Um, and those were some of the things I learned then that stick with me today. And that was the discipline of having to, you're in high school, staying out late, having to wake up every single morning and to deliver the news. Because if you didn't do it, everybody in your neighborhood would be upset they didn't get their paper and they knew who, who let them down. Um, and so that, that discipline has stuck with me, waking up every morning, just like waking up and getting ready to go to practice, waking up, going to school, get, waking up and going to work, that stays with you. Um, and then the sacrifice of, things that you couldn't do because you had a job and you had responsibilities and learning how to manage money um, and the consequences I talked about, the consequences of not doing what you're supposed to do and everyone in your community knowing um, they don't have the newspaper because you didn't wake up on time. 
Um, so those were things I learned at an early age that have stuck with me um, 20, 30 years later. Well, I think, you know, looking at your list, you better lift up the marriage and kids part. Because um, if your wife ever sees this, I'm not so sure that um, it'll be. This, is, this, was a, this was a life progression. I started when I was a kid. I went to college and then, you know, all the things, you know, I picked up as I was growing in my career. Um, but then, I mean, that's the reality of it, right? Like, I think a lot of times um, we talk about, in sessions like this, you talk about somebody's work. And that, that is how we define success. And I remember early on in my career, someone told me, you know, when there are, there are people you see where you're like, man, I want to be that person when I grow up. Or that's, that's who I want to be. Look at their bios. Look at how many of them are still married or unmarried or don't have kids. And, and start to talk to people about that, right? That whole definition of success in your life you have to define what success and happiness is and it isn't always your title and your paycheck and and you can find success and happiness in a lot of different areas um and so for me you know part of that is marriage and and kids and trying to find other passions outside of work and trying to figure out what balance means i don't know what balance is i'm still trying to figure that out um but all of that goes into your own personal definition of success, your own personal definition of happiness. And so I, I purposely wanted to get this last because when I say last one of all these topics, first impressions matter. Ex ex yeah. Expand on that a little bit, please. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's something that I was, you know, impacted by early on in my career. Um, and people, I fortunately had people pull me aside to tell me certain things very early. Um, and then as I moved into a management role, also realizing how impactful it is, um, the impressions that people make. And that that is, you know, early on for me, I'll just it was how I was dressing, right? Like I didn't, I'd never worked in an office. I didn't know how to dress. Um, and I remember someone pulling me aside very early on and saying, hey man, you need to tuck your shirt in. I mean, it was little stuff like that. Um, I just didn't know how to behave in those environments um, because first impressions really, really matter and, and sometimes can overshadow the work that you do um, is the impression that you make in terms of how you interact with people, how you present yourself, how hard you work, um, you know, first one in, last one out, people notice that. Um, so all of that stuff really, really matters. So when you, I, I get all of that and when I, I wanna talk about because I want to make sure that the students really get something out of this. So are you saying they haven't gotten anything yet? Well, I want to make sure that they do. And, <laughs> and so this is this is the part where it goes, you know, and you mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I, I always try to emphasize it. When did you realize that not only were you in the right major, but mm -hmm. it was something that if you stayed with it, you saw the you saw the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, this is probably not the answer you're looking for, but I didn't, I really, I did not know at the time that I was in college. Um, I think what I got most out of college were some of those more basic values of the things that are on this page. Um, and then just sort of broad learning about the world. Like I wouldn't, you know, one thing I try to tell people don't like unless you really, really know what you want to do, like don't narrow your focus. You just don't know where your life is going to take you. Um, so although, you know, I actually majored in public policy and international affairs, I didn't start working in an international space until two years ago. Um, so for me, it was all about, you know, learning how to work hard, you know, all about knowing your stuff, regardless of what it is. Um, and then just generally, you know, trying to absorb as much knowledge and information as possible. And that's, you know, it's, it's interesting because one of the things that I've found for myself and other people that have made them successful also is being able to pull in information just from other parts of, you know, different, I guess, outside of your industry. So the more that you understand macroeconomics and microeconomics, the more that you understand history and politics, is going to make you better at your job, regardless of what it is. Even if you're in marketing, you need to know all of those things. They're gonna make you so much better at the work that you do. 
Okay. It's because I asked that because you stuttered and you had international part of your studying in college. Yeah. Yeah. But you didn't think you would be the COO of international at some point. No. Wow. No. Okay. No. Um, I've always been interested in it, but it was, yeah, it was also the public policy part of it. And, and that, that major, what really drew me to it was that it was interdisciplinary. And so it allowed me to take courses in history and in economics and in politics and in religion and in science. And it was all required um, in order to get my degree because it was at the time, the understanding was like, you're gonna be better, you know, if you understand all of those things. Okay, so I, I hear what you're saying. And then I guess it goes back to some, one of the other points you had on the, on the uh, slide, constant learning. Mm -hmm. and filling the gaps, yep. um, you know, what, give me, give a couple of examples. Cause I know when yeah. I was in school, technology wasn't what it was now. Yeah. So and, that's, and, that's, that's, that's exactly what I was going to say. I was going to say three things. I think technology is one um, of the world changes and you have to change with it or else you'll get left behind. And so that was one of those, right? Like I was in college, the, the, Email was just becoming a thing when I was in college. So that's how long ago that was. So you have to evolve as the world changes. Um, and then the other is, you know, pulling in information. So I work in football, but I, I read things like Wired Magazine just to understand where, you know, technology is heading just broadly, um, trying to use that to make me better at my, uh, my job, which isn't directly about technology. Um, so trying to pull in information from different sources um, you know, when you get into a meeting room, you know, everybody's reading Sports Business Journal, right? Everybody's reading those articles. So you're not going to bring anything new to the table if you're reading the same information. You've got to go where, where people aren't reading to bring in new and enlightening information. Um, and then just making yourself better, right? There's so many things you don't learn in college. Like, I never learned how to negotiate, right? Like, you, I didn't have negotiating one-on-one. -on -one. So you have to go get a book on negotiating and figure out how to get good at it. Uh, okay. So that's part of filling the gaps. So um, I want to I want to speed up a little bit here. I know we have some questions that have been sent in. And Dave, I'm going to ask you uh, here, do we can we get the students to ask themselves or David, I'm, I'm going to bring um, our first up will be Reginald. I'm going to bring Reginald in now. OK. And then from Reginald, we'll go to Leonidas. And then I believe we do have a question from from Jamie Land as well. But let me bring Reg in first. Okay, Reginald, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Hi, I'm my, I'm Reginald. Um, I'm a current sophomore, and I'm on the track team. So the question that I had put in the um, question and answer was: Is marketing different um, here in the United States than internationally? The, the, there, there are things that about it that are different, but the core of it is, I don't think is not. So for me, what is marketing? Marketing is about building an emotional connection between the consumer and whatever the product is. Making them feel a certain way is what marketing is. That's why Nike is so good. They make you feel a certain way about their brand and about their product. And, and those feelings are going to be different based on what you're trying to sell. Those feelings can be joy. They can be about making you feel like you're a part of a, a select group because you drive a luxury vehicle. They can be about protection and safety if you're selling insurance, but you're trying to make them feel something emotionally connected to your product or service. Now, depending on the country you're in, you're gonna have different tactics, whether it's technology, obviously language, um, but then also culture. Um, all of those things are gonna be different, but I, I think the, the core of it doesn't change regardless of what country you're in. Thank you. Reginald, thank you so much. Ronnie, I wanna um, expand on, on something that, that Reginald said in terms of when you look at international, right? As, and I just wanna be frank here, as a minority um, at the NFL, you know, were there any challenges that you had to face? Because a lot of times, let's face it, when we get into companies, there's also internal um, culture that you have to. So how was that experience for you to go from business, business development for football to 
running the international. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, that's the reality, not of just this place, but I think a lot of workplaces is that there's top level diversity of just sort of representational diversity overall organizationally do what mixture of race and gender do we have? And then you start to look at functional, you know, are people in operations or are people in consumer facing revenue generating areas that are oftentimes more highly valued. And so for me, it was transitioning from one to the other. That was, that was the challenge. Um, and it's still a challenge. You know, I walk into meeting rooms and I'm the only dark spot in the room. Okay. Hey, Dale, who do we have queued up next? I know we had another student too. I, do you want me to just read or? Because that was Reginald. Is Jamie uh, Lynn? No, it's uh, Leonidas is next. Leonidas? Yeah. Okay. Hey, Leonidas, how are you? How can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. So once again, thank you for taking your time here today to speak to us. Yeah. My name is uh, Leonidas Athanasoulias, and I'm a freshman on the water polo team. So my question to you is, do you find it essential to set up specific goals in your work? For example, weekly goals, monthly goals, and yearly goals. And also, if you don't mind sharing, what are your main goals with your position right now? Yeah. So the, the, the answer to your first question is yes. And, and the way that you broke it down is exactly how you want to do it. So really short term, me, medium term and long term goals um, are all important. And short term, the, the one probably that I'm the worst at um, is daily goals, right? Is to start your day thinking these are the three things that I want to get accomplished today. I'm the worst at that because I end up being a slave to my email inbox and whatever's at the top is what I end up doing. Um, so I think the short-term goals are incredibly important, but then also the, the long-term goals, where, where do we want to be? That's about like imagination and vision. Um, I think those are really, really important because they allow everybody to understand, um, you know, where we're trying to go as a group. And then the medium term are really important because that's how you get from point A to point B. What are the steps we're going to take in order to get there? How are we going to measure our success along the way? So Yes is the short is that was a really long way of saying yes. Um, and then my goals overall, what we're trying to do is grow the number of NFL fans around the world and do that in a way that's going to deliver value. And we do that in three ways. So one is fan development and engagement. And typically that's marketing and um, social media, localized content, local language, culture, use of influencers to get more fans into the funnel. All of those things we do to grow fandom. Um, but then there's also engagement, particularly around viewership. So how do we make sure our games are distributed? Uh, right now, I think our games are in 190 countries around the world. So let's make sure everywhere around, everyone around the world has a way to watch NFL games um, in some way, shape or form. Um, and then the third is growing the game. Um, the game is really, really important. Um, we, we don't always do a good job of remembering that, but people are fans of football players and football teams. And we need to grow the game of football and the number of international players there are around the world if we're going to grow football in the NFL as something that people care about. It was really humbling to me going into this role and going into different countries around the world and realizing how little people cared about football. It's such a big deal in this country. And you leave this country, people are like, one, football means soccer. Um, they, so they're talking about American football. Um, and you realize how little uh, importance it is in some markets and how much work we have to do. So Leonidas, I'm a little upset with you, but really Jamie Lynn should be because Dale, can you let Jamie Lynn ask her question, which the amount of you yeah. teed up, it, you well, just you teed up what? for it. The great thing about that is now Jamie Lynn should be coming in uh, right behind us, but she can, I would say she, her question was really about that and, and you exactly. kind of answer that. But here's what I think, Jamie Lynn, are you with us yet? Yeah. Yes. And I'll let you, you may just want to tell a little bit about yourself, but I would add, what I would add to the, to your question now to add a little beef to it is how, is, how did he develop a value proposition to, to attract those clients who look at football as being, as being uh, a, a soccer, right? Mm -hmm. so, so I'll, but we'll, let, let me let you ask that question and introduce yourself. I think that's more important. Right. 
Okay, yeah. Um, hello, my name is uh, Jamie Shimamoto, and I'm a sophomore on the women's soccer team. And my question was, yeah, like they said, similar to the last one, which was like, since American football is only played here in the NFL and in the United States, like what are some specific strategies that you've used to drive like the fan development and interest worldwide? And like, like you said, like internationally, I guess soccer, when you, when you say football, it's known as soccer. So like, how have you spread like American football in a sense globally? Yeah. So it's, it's been, and I said some of those things, but like, you know, in, influencer marketing as much as, you know, with two teenage girls, as much as I hate it, it works um, in trying to like bridge the gap and introduce something. So we, we spend a lot of time and energy just trying to get local influencers in these markets, just wearing NFL jerseys and talking about, you know, great plays they saw and doing that on Instagram stories, doing that on TikTok. Um, so that, that is one way to get people just aware of the game of football. And then the other is we spend time trying to grow the game of football. So we invest in flag football for youth and trying to make it part of what we call PE classes um, in schools and make that a part of the program that, that students are involved in. Um, and then we, at the top, we call the top of the football funnel. Um, we spend a lot of time trying to find elite athletes in other sports, um, rugby players and so on, teach them a game of football, put them on NFL teams and see if they develop. So I don't know if we have any Eagles fans in the room, but the Philadelphia Eagles, their right tackle, Jordan Mailata, we met him two years ago. He's gigantic. He's 6'8", 350 pounds, had never played football, never been in a three-point stance. Dave talked about being in Australia. That's where we found him. We went to Australia. He was a rugby player, great feet, didn't know anything about football. Three years later, he's the starting right tackle of the Philadelphia Eagles. People in Australia now, know more about the NFL because he is what we call a local hero. He's on the local news. They're talking about an Australian who's in this NFL league. Um, and it's just helping us break down the barriers between us and, and these countries where it's not that popular. So Monique had to chime in that she's from Philly. There we go. Fly I'm fly. sure she didn't know the left tackle was, you know, from yeah. Australia. Yeah. But uh, before I get to the next question, D, I I want you to kind of, expand on although you know the question was about how do you guys take the game so one of the challenges that I don't think people understand was just having a stadium that was Absolutely. properly built for the NFL so Absolutely. talk about how you guys are you know doing that over overseas yeah and, and that's been that is one of our bigger challenges so the pretext of that is right which gets to Jamie Lynn's question of how you get people to understand the game, you know, some of that is just delivering the game to people so they can actually see it and attend it and take in the spectacle and the environment of the NFL. And so we spend a lot of time and money putting games on internationally, but a lot of people look at a big stadium, a big soccer stadium and think, oh, you can play there. Well, the sight lines, the angles of the seats are different. Um, the locker rooms are much smaller. And so we spent our first couple of years just basically building in Mexico City. We have permanent temporary uh, locker rooms um, outside the stadium that we use because the teams are much bigger than soccer teams. And then the next iteration of that is what we're doing in London, where we partnered with Tottenham Hotspurs, um, the local EPL team there, and they were building a new stadium. And we said, hey, why don't you build it with the NFL in mind? It has a retractable field, turf field for the NFL now when we go over there multiple times a year. We have our own field. They built locker rooms for us. They didn't do all that out of the kindness of their heart. We paid a little bit for it, but we also committed to playing there twice a year for the next 10 years. Um, and that was part of our negotiation and commitment to that market. Hey, D, you got some more questions for him? Or do you need me to read them? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Who you, you should have, Larry should be up. And then after Larry will be Ridwan. Okay. Larry, you're muted. Okay. Sorry. No you know, um, I'm, I'm not a student athlete, although I did play football in high school. Um, but my, my question was, uh, how much, basically, how much did like going to Ivy League school versus a non-Ivy League school catapult your career? And if there's any big major difference? I think... Um, Two, two things that were, were the, the most significant. One was, like I said, the size of the fish and the size of the pond. Um, 
you know, going from high school and thinking I was, you know, smart and also the best athlete. And you realize pretty quickly that you're not the smartest or the best athlete. Um, and so that was, that was impactful. Um, and then that was, you know, the point that's on the, the, the initial slide about brands matter um, and, and the brand of Princeton and how that, you know, helps with that first impression. But um, it's not the end all be all by any stretch. Um, you know, it, it takes a quick Google search of, you know, whoever you think is successful to see their background and where they came from. And not everybody is coming from an Ivy League school and not everybody that goes to an Ivy League school you know, is, is successful. Um, so it's not the end all and be all by, by any stretch of the imagination. Nothing, nothing can be hard work, nothing. And so, and I'll, I'll add to that, former NFL EVP of communications and government affairs, Joe Brown is a St. Francis graduate. Yeah. And Joe, as, as Damani will test, is a legend in NFL. Yep. Yep. Um, you know, long time employee, very much powerful. So, you know, Joe started where you are. And, you know, in fact, he hired Roger Goodell as an intern. Yeah. So, you know, just think about the fact that where you are right now, you know, it's not Princeton, but St. Francis can get you to the top. But as Damani said, it's going to require you to take advantage of all the opportunities, do things like you're doing today. But more importantly, when you leave, follow up. You know, if there's one thing I could say to all the students on here, um, you'd better follow up with Damani, you know, with an email address, you know, because he's going to give you that. And I say that because that's part of the networking that goes involved. And there are thousands of times, I mean, many times you're in programs like this, you're talking to everybody, you give up your time, and then no one follows up. And so it's like, what's the purpose? I mean, you have a contact right here, an intern right here, all of you that direct outfit because you can say hey i was i saw you on that zoom when at st francis so just think about that as you guys go forward um d who you have next we should have ridwan and then after ridwan we have bora okay what i'll do is i'll read his question okay just so so from ridwan it was what's your advice for graduating seniors who are trying to balance their commitment to their sport while trying to figure out what they want to do after graduation? Um, do it. Like that, it, that's, that is, I mean, that's the part about time management that I say that you learn that does not go away. And, and it, it, I feel like an old man saying it, but life is not going to get any easier for you. So while it can feel very overwhelming right now, trying to play soccer, I think I heard you say, um, and trying to do coursework and figure out um, what job you're going to take, that's not changing. And in fact, it's just going to get it's going to get worse. Um, you're going to, you know, your job will take on more. You know, your life, your your personal life will take on more. Um, it's not going to get any easier. So that's, I, um, yeah, you just you have to do it. There's really there's really no there's really no option. Um, really. It's either that or failure. So you just have to do it. I wish you didn't mention the Philadelphia Eagles because now everyone in the chat room <laughs> is going back Steelers, <laughs> Eagles. So let's there get, go. Let's get a, let's get focused people. There um, go. Dale, who do you have next for us? Uh, we should have, I believe after that was, uh, we have Bora. Bora should Bora? be up. Okay. Bora, who's who's your team? You got now that we're talking the NFL. Also, want to know who people's teams are. Bora, can you um, unmute yourself? Yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. This is Bora. I'm uh, working as a manager of SFC International here at college, and I'm also coaching men's water polo team. Um, so my question was regarding the challenges of um, students. Uh, in terms of the professional career, so early on, students go into the you know, professional field, and we live in a society where there, there is a presence of that instant gratification. We expect we're going to make a difference right away at the first job we get. And, you know, unfortunately, that's followed by a lot of disappointment uh, from those students. And then, you know, there is not enough motivation, ambition behind it, because the expectation was, I'm going to make that difference. So how do we, you know, uh, approach them? How do we explain that there needs to be a process of growth, a process of 
uh, a kind of that maturity, professional maturity, uh, to get you to the point where you're actually going to be able to create that impact before that disappointment kicks in. Yeah, it, it, it is something that's a great, it's a great point because it's something that I actually feel bad about the current generation. Uh, the, the current generation is living in a period where young people become millionaires and billionaires, right? Because they created Facebook. Um, and, and, and then people think that that's the norm, that's the expectation, and it's not. Um, and, and that's why I said it's more about you trying to find your passion. Like, what are the things that you really are interested in working on? Um, and when, when you find that, that, that ends up being where you find your joy um, is because you're working in an area that, you know, um, you find passionate, um, find passion. And, and, you know, then, and then defining you know, your point of making a difference um, you know, the, the commissioner, like, isn't just going to walk down the hall and, and hand the keys to an intern. Um, you've got to prove yourself and show that you can take on more and more responsibility over time. Um, the one thing that I do try to tell young people is there's so much going on in the world now that's new, particularly as it relates to technology and media that companies now, right? Companies are craving that audience, that 18 to 34 year old audience companies are craving. Well, that's who you are. You are the expert in that area. So lean into that. That's what you can easily deliver and say, look, I, I live this world, right? I'm on these platforms. I understand this community that we're trying to sell to um, and, and use that to, to, to be part of your contribution to whatever work you're doing. That's, that's a great, great point. And I think what, what some should take out of that is who would think you would hear that when you saw NFL COO? Right, that he's telling you, the eight you students, you guys basically have the power. You are who they need to in order to go where they need to go, which is eventually hit that twenty-five billion dollar mark. Absolutely. So, um, yeah. So. I mean, it's it's I I my my sixteen-year-old daughter is sick of it. But I I go home, I ask her questions about social media platforms. I show her draft copies of commercials that are trying to target young people and say, does this resonate with you? you like the music on this commercial? Um, all of those things I do because that's who we're, we're trying to connect with. Uh, who do we have next? Is it Mateo? That is correct. You have Mateo. And I believe due to time constraints, Mateo will be the last question. But as David stated earlier, uh, please look to reach out via LinkedIn or please look to reach out via LinkedIn because that's the best way because unfortunately this will be our last question uh, and that is from Mateo. So we will not be able to get to the questions after Mateo but please look to connect with Damani via LinkedIn. Hi everybody, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, hi, hi everyone. I'm an international student. I'm a freshman on the Whirlpool team and oh, my water coach, polo players wow yeah water polo player oh and, where are you from i'm from italy okay and and my question is um how how did you um fa face uh, how did you took your first steps into the um, uh, world of of work after right after your graduation yeah um it was that's a good question it was um internships for me and that's you know that's part of uh, I can't remember his question the manager of the program you, know, you talk about sacrifice and impact and I had to do that early on so the first thing I had to do was turn down an internship in New York City because it was unpaid it was working in sports but it was unpaid and I couldn't afford um, to do that so I had to turn it down then I did an internship at the PGA Tour and at the NCAA um, doing things I didn't know that I wanted to do, you know, the first one was in sponsorship. The second one was in rules compliance. I didn't know anything about either one of them, but I just did it because I wanted to work in sports. But during both of those, I also worked part-time. So I would, you know, on the weekends in Kansas city, deliver Papa John's pizza. That's why the Papa John's pizza logo is on the screen. I delivered pizza to help pay my rent because the, the internship didn't cover it all. Um, so the early on, definitely it was internships and sacrifice and, working two jobs just to, um, to make ends meet. D, I, I really appreciate that. And I think one of the things students, I don't think they may have caught it, but you're originally from Tacoma, Washington. 
which may not be, you can't get any further than New York City. <laughs> than right. Tacoma. So be open to understanding where you may end up in this world, may not be in New yeah. York City. So don't limit yourself to thinking you, don't, you have to remain here. Um, so uh, unfortunately- definitely, definitely not. I know you guys <laughs> like New York City and you think it's the end all be all, but there's other places in the country you can live besides yeah. New York City. And so because of, you know, somewhat time constraints, I think we want to kind of like wrap up. And Damani, I really just want to say thank you because I know how busy you are and really appreciate you giving the students your time. And I know if as any follow-up, you'll be there for them. And so really, really thank you very much. Um, sure. And uh, I think we're going to go, are we going to Maggie? We're going to go to Maggie right from now? here. Yeah. So, so Maggie, my new boss, um, please come in and, let everybody know how wonderful you are. <laughs> New boss, I like that. All right, all right. Hey, I'm 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 not as young as some of the the student athletes and students on here, but you can pick my brain for ideas too. I have, I have some thoughts and ideas. <laughs> no, but uh, thank you, Damani. Thank you, David. Thank you, Dale, for for you know coming and putting this together. Um, I want to touch on a couple things that I think you said uh, that were really important. And I think can resonate a lot for our students, especially right now. You know, the immediate gratification and what does success look like right like how, you know how much money my friend makes versus me um and so something that president miguel martinez signs always says and i'm going to paraphrase so but he says it's it's more important to make a life than it is to make a living and so i think that has something to do with finding success right like finding what you're passionate about and and following your dream and just going for it um, but you have to be open you have to be open to finding those opportunities and attending sessions like this or, you know, meeting people, sending the money an email, sending myself working, volunteering. Those are things that are going to open up doors for people. So thank you so much for coming and for being here and for sharing some knowledge with our students. And I know you're busy. I know the NFL is, uh, is crazy right now. All sports are crazy right now. And every industry is a little bit turned upside down, but um, we stay as positive as we can through it. So thank you so much for being here. Appreciate it. Maggie, really appreciate that. And I guess, you know, other than Miguel starting, it seems like ending with Reza is only proper. You know, go from from good. To, what is it? Good, better, to best. Do my best. Well, anyway, Mr. You know what, <laughs> nobody can match. Uh, nobody can match Miguel. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, David. Uh, the money. That was a fascinating conversation. I loved hearing about. Uh, your life progression and the key learnings and uh, and you presented in such an interesting and exciting way. I also love the way you define success and happiness and the fact that you're still trying to achieve that balance between life and work. Uh, aren't we all trying to do that? On behalf of the college, uh, I thank you very much for honor, honoring us by your presence and uh, I am sure our students have been inspired by you today and see you as a role model. Uh, thank you again and thank you Dave and Dale uh, for facilitating all of this. Appreciate it. Uh, is anyone gonna be the final wrap up? Are we good? I think, um, I think we're all good, Dave. Uh, great okay. job. Thank you again, Damani. With, uh, understand that these, these playbook sessions, this series is all about focusing on making sure you as student athletes understand that prepare now for life after sports. If college sports is, is the end of it, don't let that be the end of your passion for what you love to do, but make sure that you can utilize your passion for and love for sport to build a career if that's what you choose or if you choose to be a doctor or what have you understand that there's options, but you have to start working on those options now. And and Dave Cummings is gonna be the guy to bring you a lot of great talent like Damani to come share their thoughts on how to do this. We thank you again for coming and appreciate you. See you next time. Always be prepared. I'm a Boy Scout, so that's my, that's my thing. Always be <laughs> Thanks, Thanks everybody. So much, Damani. Damani. All right, thank goodbye you. everybody.